Hi, everyone. My name is Ryan Randall, and I'm from the ITRC here at ISU. And thank you for joining for Christina Glick's presentation for OER Week. Christy is an assistant lecturer in the ISU Department of Art. She has been head of the ISU Metals and Jewelry Program since being hired at the fall of 2017. She received her MFA in metal design from East Carolina University in 2007 has been, and has been teaching in higher ed since 2009. In addition to teaching, Christy is a practicing studio artist with a specialty in metalsmithing, enameling, jewelry, and drawing. Her research focuses on exploring the intersection of chance and purpose during the creative process. I'm excited to hear from her, and I'm sure you are too. So now, take it away, Christy. Thanks, Ryan, for that introduction. And I also just wanted to start off by saying thanks to the OER committee for the stipend um, to help support the work of creating this um, OER, because it is, as anyone who's done this um, knows, it does take some time and effort. So thank you to all of you. Um, as Ryan said, I'm Christy Glick, and I teach in the art department. I am talking today about my OER development process for the course Art 1100, uh, 1104, 3D design. This course, and I want to describe a little bit what the course is. Um, these days, with all of the digital design work that's going on, you hear 3D design and you often think <clears throat> computer modeling. But this is actually a hands-on studio course where students are primarily learning through making small sculptures, as well as um, related kind of reading and writing assignments. But it is a studio class, a hands-on class. So the textbook portion that I had been using for this class was a supplementary material, not primary material. So um, it supported the lectures and the hands-on demonstrations that I would do in the class. The, the purpose of the textbook that I was originally using was primarily a way to um, give the students this um, the ability, the possibility of seeing a wide range of artworks. Because here in Pocatello, we don't have a lot of chance for students to go to galleries or museums. And so having a textbook that has a lot of high quality images of um, professional artworks was key. Um, I also liked that it provided um, additional reading materials, which um, I should say that the 3D design class is an introduction level class. It's a foundation course for the art department. And I find that for students at that level, having um, readings that go along with their hands-on learning helps to reinforce the learning. So the reading, the images, um, and then also I just really like to make sure that students understand that being an artist is more about is about more than just making art. You have to be able to speak about it and read about it and write about it. So those were my purposes for having a textbook to start with, with for this class, because often in studio classes, we don't use textbooks. Um, this course is designed to be taken by all art majors. So whether they're getting our BFA degree or our BA degree, they need to take this as one of their foundational courses. It pairs with uh, two-dimensional design. It usually serves between 12 and 15 students a semester. It is offered every semester. So when we're looking at numbers, it's um, creating an OER for this course doesn't affect a huge number of students overall in the university, but in our department, it will affect every art major who comes through the door. So um, it definitely is worth thinking about in terms of our departmental uh, dynamics. I first developed the course itself, 3D design in the fall of 2020. And at that point, I did research and find and adopt a textbook, which I used. Um, there weren't a whole lot of textbooks out there available that focus in particularly on three-dimensional design. It's a pretty niche um, area. And so there's not a lot of even uh, traditional textbooks available, but I did find one that I liked and I used it for, um, for a year. Students really enjoyed it. And at this point in time, I wasn't really even very aware of what an OER is, what, you know, what their purposes were, how they um, are used, but 
what made me start to think about um, the, pos the possibility of using an OER is just the way the cost changed for that textbook that I was using. So the textbook I found was Launching the Imagination, which was a great text, exactly what I needed. It didn't have a lot of um, extra information. We used the whole textbook. So it was actually a great fit. But when I first adopted it in 2021, um, the cost to students was either $25 to purchase or 22 to rent, which seemed very affordable to me. Within a year, those costs had more than doubled. So by that next spring, it was $79 to purchase and 65 to rent. And that made me just worry that if that trend continued, um, already those, those raised prices were becoming a burden to our students. And so at that point in time, I thought, oh, well, I should at least see what this OER situation is um, and what I might be able to do. Um, so at that point, I started off by um, talking to Amy Jo Popa, who is a colleague of mine in the art department, because I knew that she had adopted a free and open source textbook for our Art 1100 Introduction to Art course. So I knew we were already using one OER in the department. So I started off by speaking with her. And she told me a little bit about her process of finding the book that they used. It was an already existing textbook, covered most of what she needed in the course, and she could adjust it as needed. Um, and so that gave me the idea that, well, yeah, this, this might be possible, might be a good idea. And she said that it had um, huge success with the students. Great appreciation for that lowered cost was um, a big thing that she got feedback on. So after talking with her, I next went and talked to a couple of the ISU librarians, particularly Jenny Semenza, who works with the art department. And the first thing she mentioned, which again, I was not aware of this, was that sometimes the library can purchase the textbook and have a copy that then gives shared usage to the students in the course. So she looked into that for me. Unfortunately, it wasn't viable with the textbook I was using. The only thing that was available was a license for three users, and it was very expensive. So it wouldn't have saved us any money to do that, which is unfortunate because that would have been a great solution. Um, so when that didn't pan out, she then pointed me to the library's um, OER beginning search guide, which was very helpful because I had no idea where to even approach this. Um, and this is a link here to that guide. <clears throat> And so from there, I started doing online research. And I just, this list here, OpenStax, textbook library, all those things are repositories for OERs that are out there. And so I started searching. Jenny helped me a little bit. Spent a lot of time looking and didn't find anything that was even remotely close to what I would need, um, which didn't actually surprise me, considering that there weren't many traditional textbooks in existence for this class. So it made me skeptical that anything would be out there. But I looked. Um, eventually, I decided I was just wasting my time. And so I, at that point, I had to either decide to go back to using the textbook and just have the students eat that cost or create my own materials. Um, and so at that point, I decided to go ahead and create my own materials to use since I couldn't find anything that was existing. Um, at that point, I was kind of doing a balance of uh, trying to figure out if it was was worth doing the work, et cetera. The things that I saw as the biggest drawbacks back to committing to creating my own materials was the time and the work that it would take, which is much more than adopting a textbook. Um, also, I knew that realistically with the time that I have to put towards this, I couldn't make it as comprehensive as a textbook. It just wouldn't be possible. Um, and I know from conversations with students, particularly art students who are very uh, focused on the material, some students really do like to have a physical textbook. So those were the drawbacks. In the long run, the benefits definitely outweighed that. So the no cost to students was a big one, particularly since um, in the art department for studio classes, when a student registers for a class, they already pay a lab fee. Um, so they're already paying an, an additional fee for materials. Um, and so we try not to have too many textbook fees on top of that. So no cost was a huge one. <clears throat> Another thing that was nice about creating my own is, of course, I can include only what fits my needs. 
Um, that wasn't such a big one because the textbook I had found really didn't have extraneous information, but um, that is a nice plus to creating your own materials. Um, I also liked that because I was going to use a digital format, anything that I posted to Moodle meant that students had easier access. They wouldn't have to have a physical book. They could ask, access it from anywhere. Um, and then that ability to modify the materials at will with no problem of copyright, that sort of thing. And while I am currently the only professor who teaches 3D design, it's um, possible that in the future that will transition to one of my colleagues. And in that case, I could give them those materials. And again, we wouldn't have any copyright issues. So all of those things made me decide, yes, go ahead and move forward, um, create some materials. And at that point, I had to think about, well, what format do I want to use to convey the information that I need? And I considered a bunch of different things, but ended up um, deciding to create PowerPoint presentations. Um, first of all, because they're easy to create and easy to view. I'm very familiar with making them. I didn't have a learning curve to learn how to make them. Um, they are a great format for image-based content, which is really a large part of what I needed for the students. So the slide can have the image and then any, any extra text can be put in the slide notes so that um, they aren't distracting from the image. You can embed links to videos and websites, which is a, a big plus. They're easy to post on Moodle where they're password protected, so they're not just out there in the world. Um, and they can be converted to PDFs if students don't have software for the PowerPoints. So I decided to make um, a series of PowerPoints that would focus on the different modules that I teach. Um, so, just a quick, this is just a quick sample of the type of PowerPoint presentation that I created. And I, I don't know exactly, I think I have between 11 and 14 of these created now. Um, but they are mostly image-based. And one of the things that um, I really also liked from the textbook in addition to the images was that there were um, definitions of terms. So one of the things we're trying to get students familiar with at this level is just the terminology we use to talk about art. And so while um, I'll start off with a general heading that tells what's, what the PowerPoint's gonna be about, I might have some images there, but then we'll also have some definitions that, that are key to what I want students to be able to learn to speak about. Um, and then the bulk of the PowerPoints is image-based like this slide. So if we're talking about two-dimensional art versus three-dimensional art, we had those definitions in the last slide. And then in this slide, we can see some full um, image, full screen images of examples of those things. And then if the students go in and look at the slide notes, there will be, um, here you can see the image on the left is an example of two-dimensional art, the center image is three-dimensional. So that way they can, um, if it's not immediately clear, the text is there for them. And then the other thing that I always include here is um, attribution for the image, materials and location of where that image was found. Um, because another thing we want students to be paying attention to is who the artists are, what kind of materials are used. And so all of that information is in the notes because primarily we want the students to look at the image and then read the information. So as you would go through this type of PowerPoint, it bounces back and forth between um, a little bit of text, but then mostly image-based um, information. And the largest part of the work for making these PowerPoints is finding images, because it is really important that I'm finding images that are um, representing whatever it is I'm trying to talk about, so a form with volume, um, and that the, the work is a professional level artwork that has been photographed in a professional way so that students can really see what's going on. Um, and so finding and sourcing those images is definitely what took the most of my time. Um, once I would find images, putting it all together into the PowerPoint was pretty quick. So you can see as students could go through um, this sort of thing, um, they have the, the key information, both visual and written, that they would need. And then this would just be an example of how you can also embed a link so that this is a kinetic artwork, which has a lot of movement to it. And so the students here can actually click, see that video um, in real time. Um, so that format 
worked out really well for me, the PowerPoint format. And um, I, the next thing to think about then was how I wanted to make them accessible to the students. And um, because it's a studio-based hands-on class, uh, Moodle is, I don't use Moodle a huge amount. I use it as a way to give students the calendar, the assignments, those sorts of things. Um, and so I have it divided by weeks. And in each week, when I introduce a new section, there will be a hyperlink to the PowerPoint. And I'll actually switch over to Moodle here real quick. So this is what my Moodle page looks like. And if we go down to, let's choose a week in February. Um, let's find one where we're introducing something new. <laughs> There's a lot going on. Um, okay, so in, in a week like this, um, any new information will have a hyperlink here where they could click and the PowerPoint will just open up in another window. So that's really easy to use on a date-based sort of thing. But if a student is, let's say we're a month into class and they're thinking, well, what, what day did we talk about types of form? And they don't wanna scroll back and try to find that link in the week, then they can just scroll to the bottom of the class page and we have all the PowerPoints together in one spot so that they can just go down and find that PowerPoint that they want. And then I also have all of my other class handouts organized in the same way with a hyperlink and then all of them at the end. Um, so posting them in that way um, seems to have worked really well. Students find it easy to, to manage. They can find the resources when they need them um, and they're available as needed. So now um, these, this series of PowerPoints is the OER material that I'm using. This semester is the second semester that I'm teaching with the OER. In the fall, which was the first time I used it, I also used two text, two chapters from the original textbook that I was using um, because in conversation with Jenny Semenza, she thought that that would be a perfectly um, legal way to use it, just a small portion of the text and pr password protected on um, Moodle. So I did originally use two of those chapters, which I really liked having that additional material, but I was never quite sure whether it felt totally legal or not. So I talked with a couple other librarians um, and um, one of them in particular said, well, you know, it's kind of on that edge. I'm not sure that would be okay for prolonged use. So as of this semester, I'm no longer using those parts of the textbook. Um, so, I am overall very happy with how the PowerPoints are working out. I would like to continue to add some other outside readings as possible um, to kind of supplement the, the materials that I've made. Um, but what I have is plenty. So it's just one of those things where you can add and enrich as you find other, other sources that are um, clearly legal to be used. Um, and so then after the first semester I used it, which was last fall, I did put together a survey because I was very curious to see what student feedback would be. And I think I had 14 students in that class. And I asked a bunch of different questions, but the overall response was 100% um, appreciation of the OER versus a textbook. I didn't have any student who said, I really would have preferred a textbook. And there were a lot of different reasons, but it mostly boiled down to cost, ease of accessibility, and the fact that they felt like they were getting all the information they needed. They don't, didn't feel like they were missing anything. Um, even the students who said that they missed having a hands-on textbook still preferred the OER because of cost savings. So um, there you have it. That's a little bit of my experience. Um, thanks for letting me share.